Now to talk about this tax plan and other events in Washington is Congressman Mark Desaunier from Cong Concord. Certainly was a busy, busy couple of weeks in the, as you guys wound up the year. Busy is one way to describe it. <laughs> Crazy is, is another. I'm trying to be Inept, diplomatic. Inconfident. <laughs> that would be a first. <laughs> <laughs> the tax bill. You voted no. Why? Oh, it's a horrible bill. It's a horrible piece of legislation. So they did make it incrementally better. Uh, the medical deduction goes on for two years. That's really good for people. Uh, the student tax deduction continues. Right. Uh, the locals tax and the mortgage tax gets better. Right. Although for Californians and the coast, it's, it's still horrible. You're going to lose about $8,000. But the worst part is it added probably another trillion to trillion and a half dollars to the deficit. When did Democrats all of a sudden become concerned about that? I think a lot of us always were. I was. Um, but this is, we're now well over 100% of GDP. So we're not where Japan and Greece is, but most economists, even liberal ones, would say you've got to start putting the brakes on that at some point. And it aims us quite clearly at the Republicans going after Social Security and Medicare. But meanwhile, the economy is bustling right along. It's doing great if you've got investments, but for average people, it's still marginal because wages are still stuck. So if you've got, if you're one of the 20% of Americans who have investments in the stock market, you're doing well there. But for the people who pay their bills by wages, they're not doing so well. That, and that's the dichotomy we have here, is that Trump was supposed to help those people and he's not. He clearly doesn't care about them. But they seem to continue to support him. No, his numbers have gone down. They I mean, have. He's, he's got a third right. that are going to stick with him because they get their information from somebody other than Phil Mateer. All right. <laughs> Government shutdown. Your vote on that. I voted against the continuing resolution. I voted for disaster release. So there were two. Um, they get complicated because of the, the maneuvering, the political move, maneuvering. But a lot of these people in the, in the Republican caucus, the Freedom Caucus people, take a walk when they actually have to go on record. And I think that's bad for democracy. Okay, but let's take a look at that because if people don't understand. How could you vote against, a, people vote against a disaster relief? Uh, well, I voted for it. Right, but other Democrats in the Bay well, Area. Well, I'm just asking, theoretically, is it because the people loaded up with so many other things? Is that the reason? No, I think it was more, and I could have voted no for it. A lot of my colleagues in the Bay Area did. Um, because there wasn't enough in there for, for California, there wasn't enough in there, for, particularly for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So it's very prejudicial in my view. It's loaded up for Republican areas and it's, it's backloaded for Democratic areas. So when you come to disaster release, that shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be the United States Congress responding to the disaster for everybody, whether you live in a blue state or a red state. That was the... That How was, do you as a politician, I'm just wondering the vulnerability of I'm a public servant. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As a public servant. How do you as a public servant go back to your constituents and say, I voted against disaster relief for California and wait, because it wasn't enough? Well, I, that's, that's an argument that if I had voted no, I voted yes, I would have made. And I think um, you can make a compelling argument, given that so many people in my constituency in the Bay Area just don't trust the Republicans, and they shouldn't. So why did you vote yes? I voted yes because I really did think, and Mike Thompson, Jared Huffman, my district is very close to where the fires were. Um, we could have easily been impacted by them, so I voted yes. Okay, and now the government shut down. All right. How much of that is real and how much of that is posturing? Because we always have these shot now. They're, 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 they're posturing and, and but it's, it's bad public policy. You should, do the, you should do budgeting for the full fiscal year and all the departments then know. Now you, you're sitting, you're running a department or division somewhere here in San Francisco or all around the country and you're trying to anticipate what your budget's going to be for the next year. You would never do that in the private sector. I mean, you anticipate, but you have a projection. In this case, we don't know because Congress is dysfunctional. Given this dysfunctional nature of Congress and the ongoing dysfunctional nature of Congress. <laughs> it gives dysfunctional a bad name. <laughs> it does. But how, does the, how, do, how do we survive? How do we keep rolling? Every day the lights come on. I mean, I mean people show up for their jobs. The government shows up for their jobs. It yeah, keeps it, rolling it, it, along it, while all this is going on. It doesn't work. I mean, Phil, I've, I've served at the city council level, the county level, the regional level, the state level, and the federal level. Congress is by far and away, in my experience, the most most dysfunctional, the, the most lacking um, in analytical tools, and the most driven by partisan politics. Well, let's take a look at that on the local level. You have proposed, along with Senator Dianne Feinstein, for another Southern Cross, another rail and possibly <laughs> uh, or car and rail bridge, and it's getting resistance from local lawmakers who say thanks, but not now. 
How functional is that? No, it's not. I served for almost 10 years on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. I've looked at regional transportation commissions around the world in my time in the legislature and there. Ours is not a good one. It's driven by political relationships almost predominantly. And other areas have moved to a model that's driven more by engineering and how do you move the most people as efficiently as possible. So in that corridor, it's the worst corridor in the Bay Area for, for congestion, we should be managing that to say, if, if not another Southern Crossing, then how, what do you do about that congestion? because it's impacting the economy and the quality of life. Well, I want to thank you for joining us and giving a whole new definition for dysfunctional <laughs> on the national and well, local Merry, level. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas let's, all. Let's, you know what Santa's got in his bag for you. <laughs> Congressman Mark Desaunier, thank you for joining us this morning.